Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. We have a main bus B undervolt. We've got a lot of thruster What's activity here, Houston. Just went offline. Oh, there's another master alarm, Houston. I'm checking a quad. Strike those no refresh. Maybe it's a quad. We've got a computer restart. I can figure the RCS. Yes. We've got a pretty fly. Fire doesn't make sense. We've got multiple caution and warning, Houston. We've got a reset and restart. All right, I'm going to SCS. Flight diverted. Just got right here. Pete, how much your data telling you? Uh, O2 tank 2 not reading at all. Tank 1 is at uh, 725 PSI and falling. Fuel cells 1 and 3 are... Uh, oh, Lord, what's going on here? Wait, let me get back to you. Flight GNC. Flights are all over the place. They keep going close to gimbal locks. I keep losing radius in each direction. Flight is there. It's down. Me too. One at a time, people. One at a time. One at a time. Pete, Tom, is this an instrumentation problem, or are we looking at real power loss? It's going to be a quadruple failure. It can't happen. It's got to be instrumentation. Let's get that hat plugged. The lead line is hit by me here. Yep. The tunnel's really torqued with all the tools. Uh, Pete, we've got a pretty large bang here, especially with the master alarm. This is Ship's main bus. Houston, we have a main bus A undervolt down, too. Uh, it's reading 25 and a half. They must be reading SIP right now. Uh, we got a wicked shoe up here. Oh, God, BMT, these guys are talking about bangs and shoes up there. Don't sound like instrumentation to me. You can just have to steal. Just, just stow it. We've been hit by a meteor. We'd be dead by now. He's going to try to get us out of this uh, lurch. Did you say switch to Omni Bravo? Roger, signal straight on the high. What's the story here, Jack? We keep putting with gimbal locks. Houston, I'm switching over quad C to main A. Okay, you fuel cell one, fuel cell three. We got a main bus B under bolt, bio pressure, two compressor, AC bus one, AC bus two, command module computer. Maybe this is the caution and warning. Houston, we are venting something out into space. I can see it outside of window one right now. Definitely, uh, the gas of some sort. It's going to be the oxygen. Roger, obviously we copy your venting. Give me an alarm. Okay, okay. let's have a quick Okay, let's start right at us. And good afternoon, everybody, from the University of Illinois Aerospace Engineering Department. We are celebrating our 75th anniversary of the department. And today, a very special day, April 11th, is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 13 launch. I'd like to welcome you all out this afternoon. We have a pretty good program set up for you. Some pretty distinguished panelists that are going to discuss the events of that time and what it means for the future as well. So uh, we'll get things rolling here very quickly. I'm going to do some uh, preliminary introductions of the panel and uh, we'll let the panel uh, introduce themselves as well with a little more detail and then we'll get into some questions. Uh, before we do so, I would like to talk a little bit about logistics here today. Uh, we are going to uh, have a chat box open and uh, Courtney McLaren, who uh, we owe a large amount of thanks to for setting this all up today. Uh, in fact, the entire staff within the Aerospace Engineering Department, uh, Deborah Levy, uh, Tim Cochran, uh, uh, and Diane Jeffers, uh, are all uh, always helpful when it comes to putting together uh, events like this. So I want to thank them uh, in particular. Uh, so the chat box will be open and uh, Courtney will be posting links uh, as we go along that uh, will talk about uh, some of our stories of our alumni and uh, other activities that some of our panelists have participated in. Uh, we're going to use the Q&A feature of Zoom today to uh, open uh, it up for questions towards the end of the panel discussion. Uh, you can type your discussions there and then audience members can upvote particular questions uh, by using your thumbs up icon to move the question up the chain so that I can ask those questions. 
Uh, just a reminder to everybody online, we are recording the webinar and we will post it within a couple of days. Uh, so you'll be able to check your social media panels later for particular links. So with that, I'd like to start by uh, reminding everyone that it was not around some 50 years ago about the story of Apollo 13. Uh, you just saw a short clip that uh, really was the start of the story, putting it in the history books. Uh, Commander Jim Lovell, uh, Command Module Pilot Jack Schweiger, and uh, Lunar Module Pilot Fred Hayes were the three crew people that were on that mission. Uh, they got off to uh, an interestingly good start on the Saturn V, uh, but soon thereafter, a malfunction in one of the oxygen tanks uh, brought the mission perilously close to a fatal end. Uh, fortunately, it was a successful failure. And uh, one of the people who helped contribute was there in the control room when this happened was uh, Mr. Bill Webner, who was a guidance, navigation, and control flight controller for Apollo 13. So Bill, I'd like to start with you today, let you take a couple of minutes, uh, talk about your career trajectory and uh, how you got to that control room in the first place. Uh, Bill, you're muted right now. There you go. You can hear me now? Yes, sir. I want to thank you. I'm very proud and honored to be a, a part of this panel. And uh, it seems sometimes like just last month that this all occurred, and it's been uh, close to 50 years. But my, uh, I got my bachelor's degree in 59, 1959, and uh, at the same time I was commissioned in the Air Force. And so the, my tour at NASA was my third duty assignment uh, in the Air Force from 1968 until 70. And I was one of about 300 Air Force officers assigned to NASA in all aspects of flight control and manned space flight, really, from flight control to landing recovery and uh, mission planning, all facets. And the, the uh, objective was to train us for a Air Force program called Manned Orbiting Laboratory, which did not reach fruition, but uh, it enabled 300 of us to be part of history during the, uh, the heyday of Apollo. So Bill, what was it like to sit on council that night when the uh, failure first started? Well, uh, actually I had just finished dinner and uh, I was with another flight controller by the name of Bill Straley who may be listening uh, this afternoon, I'm not sure. But um, he, we had just finished dinner and we uh, came back to my apartment to listen to the air to ground on a station called KMUSC for um, um, a manned spacecraft center. And uh, we heard the air to ground and Jim Lovell or Jack Schweikert's uh, announcement to the ground that the, uh, they had a problem. So with that, uh, Bill drove into uh, the uh, control center at that time. This was oh, around nine or 10 in the evening. I decided I was gonna go to bed and get up early and be fresh. Uh, so, because we were gonna need multiple teams uh, from that, at that point to the end of the mission. So I was not in the control center at that time, but I did notice uh, that in the film clip, there was uh, that was a, a, a typical time of that mission. They had just finished an, a TV, a live TV broadcast, and of course, then they were asked to stir the cryos, that famous command from the ground, which set off the uh, the short circuit, which resulted in the oxygen explosion. At any rate, um, there were it was typically manned about one or two people per console. Well, believe me, within one hour there were probably three times that many people in that control room. I'll bet, I'll bet. Because everybody came, it was all hands on deck and it was essentially that, uh, that mantra until splash time. And when did you think uh, your team had the confidence that you'd actually get the crew back home? When we saw them on the shoots. <laughs> That's always a good sign. Uh, Paul. Paul Bohm is from uh, the Johnson Space Center, is the, uh, found, is the uh, crew support and thermal systems manager for the Orion uh, crew and service module. 
Paul, welcome today. Uh, perhaps you could give us a little talk about your trajectory as well. I, I suspect you were a little young around the time of these events. Yeah, uh, first I just want to say, Bill, I'm honored to be here with you today because uh, um, I, yeah, I, I was five years old <laughs> during Apollo 13. So uh, uh, unfortunately didn't get to experience it the way you did. Uh, probably not a good thing the way it was, but um, I, uh, I graduated from Illinois in uh, 1989 and uh, um, essentially went to work here at the Johnson Space Center back in 1989. I've been here for 31 years. Uh, worked originally up in the astronaut office uh, doing engineering support for them and then uh, essentially went on to about 14 years of doing uh, EVA, uh, spacewalk uh, training and the mission control uh, operations for spacewalks. Uh, got to support a bunch of the shuttle missions, uh, supported the uh, building up of the uh, International Space Station uh, which is probably most of the highlight of my career was just being able to put that vehicle together on orbit. Um, and then uh, go out, going into um, uh, now uh, Rudd's Constellation program back in uh, 2008 to 2010, and then uh, that got changed by the administrations. Uh, and now I'm working on the Orion program uh, for the Orion spacecraft, uh, the vehicle to basically take us back to the moon. And I'm, I'm responsible for the uh, ECLIS system, uh, the uh, suits and all the flight crew equipment associated. So pretty much everything the crew touches inside the Orion vehicle, uh, I'm, I'm uh, responsible for that hardware. And uh, Paul, does uh, I'm sure Apollo 13 must come up in your training somewhere. How's it influence your uh, pl mission planning today? Oh, it, it's, you know, the, the things that happen uh, that you saw in the movie, I think most folks have probably seen the movie, uh, the training that we go through, uh, Bill knows it very well with going through simulations. Uh, you know, the, the sim soups uh, just do a great job at taking you and throwing the things you didn't expect at you to make you sweat while you're sitting on console. Uh, so I've uh, been through a lot of those sims. And, and what that does is it really, I want to say it takes the edge off so that when you get in that situation, you almost feel like you've been there before. And, and so it, it, it gives you that familiarity with the procedures, with the hardware, the things that you, you think you know about it, and you can try to work through it. And, and you approach it from a, I want to say almost a business-like manner from that perspective is, is, is what the mission control team is taught to do. Very neat. Very neat. Also joining us today from Washington is alumnus Michael Miller. And uh, Mike was uh, a graduate of our department and is now the founder and managing director of Comspace Development. Uh, Mike, could you tell us a little bit about what you do, how you got to where you're at? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on here. It's uh, exciting to be part of this event. Um, I was in high school during the Apollo 13 uh, era, but I watched it very closely because I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. Chose Illinois uh, to go and graduated in 19. 1976. Uh, it's interesting, you know, where uh, today's economy and what's going on with the virus, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of layoffs, there's a lot of problems. I happen to graduate during an era where it was post Apollo, and there are very few graduates at Illinois. I think I was one of maybe about a dozen to 15 uh, students that graduated in 1976, and some jobs are hard to come by. Fortunately, I started uh, my career at McDonnell Douglas working on um, launch vehicles, then went on to uh, do some commercial communications, uh, satellite program management, a company called Hughes Aircraft at the time, and eventually became an entrepreneur. Uh, teamed up with a couple of folks and was part of the founding group at Orbital Sciences Corporation. We kind of back then thought that uh, all the lessons that were learned from Apollo could now be taken and done by, by, by business and uh, try to make a, a successful company out of it. Fortunately, that worked out, and over the years, uh, been a serial entrepreneur, got into investment, and now I do some uh, consulting uh, in, uh, uh, in the aerospace and IT industry, and watch all this new activity, new space, and the new economy, whereas uh, there was hardly any money being uh, used to go into private sector space. Now we've got uh, billions that are going in every year into space. What's interesting in uh, the context is, of course, 
Apollo had a number of problems and failures and same thing in, in, in business and space overall is still tough. Uh, it still takes dedication, it still takes simulation, modeling, understanding what problems may occur and getting ahead of the curve. Those lessons were learned in Apollo and they're applied today. Yeah, one of the things I know about Mike is that he was also a member of the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. And so he's seen a lot of the insides and backsides of NASA as well. And so Mike, I'd like to ask you, how do you think NASA has changed since Apollo 13? Uh, I think uh, uh, back in uh, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, uh, there were some cultural changes that happened to, uh, to eke in uh, and uh, this was studied uh, in, in great detail, and I think NASA is a, uh, is a different organization today than it was uh, before. Uh, around uh, the Columbia time, there weren't a lot of, uh, the, the folks that, that worked on Apollo, you know, touched a lot of hardware, was part of simulation and modeling, did a lot of engineering work. Uh, sort of that was moved away during the Columbia time, and now I think uh, with this new activity, of uh, the Space Launch System, the Orion Vehicle and others. They're kind of going back to the fundamentals using the lessons learned from 50 years ago and applying them today. Very good, thank you. Well, also joining us today is our next generation of aerospace engineers. Uh, representing them is Shivani Ganesh from our aerospace engineering class of 2021. Shivani, it's great to have you here. Yeah. And, uh, I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about how you uh, got excited about the space program. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm when Apollo 13 happened. Uh, I obviously wasn't around, um, but I definitely remember reading about it in the history books when I was doing uh, various history day projects uh, when I was in middle school, actually. And that led me into really realizing that space is such an expansive frontier and the learning never really ends. So that's what led me into aerospace here. Um, and I've definitely continued on that learning journey with the Illinois Space Society, uh, which is um, my family on campus, uh, mainly involved in the aptitudes of rocketry and educational outreach initiatives. Um, but that's how I've stayed involved, really, just exciting um, endeavors with inspiring the next generation of space explorers. So, yes. Great. Well, you know, I just saw the clip from Apollo 13 that always brings chills to me when I see that. Uh, seeing how risky human spaceflight is, are you still attracted to the field? Yes. Actually, my career goals are to end up within human spaceflight, especially within ECLIS uh, and crewed systems integration endeavors, um, mainly because I think at its core, we're people teaching people about this expansive universe that we live in. So what better way than pushing the envelope in as far as how much we can achieve together? Great. Well, as you all in the audience can tell, uh, we've got a really exciting panel here, and I'm really privileged to be able to work with these folks to bring you our program today. I uh, want to encourage you to start asking your questions that you may have in our chat box. Uh, you'll find that at the bottom of your screen, about the center area, it says chat. You can enter questions there, and I'll be able to see them as they come up on the screen. Uh, there's an interesting parallel between what's happening today and what happened during Apollo 13. Uh, in fact, the uh, uh, command module pilot, Jack Schweigert, was, uh, was somewhat uh, originally the, the backup commander for this mission. T.K. Mattingly caught measles, or at least was exposed to them, uh, just prior to the mission. Usually when that happens, the entire crew is flipped out for the backup crew, but in this case, so close to launch, and for another variety of reasons that some of the backup crew were not quite in good steads with management at the time. Uh, Jack was just repositioned into TK's job and moved forward uh, with the launch of Apollo 13. Uh, unfortunately, that left uh, Charlie Duke back home and uh, he never did catch the measles. Uh, but shortly thereafter, a vaccine became available and now we don't talk that much about it. And uh, I guess a little comment here for all the anti-vaxxers out there. Uh, for those of you that want to get rid of all vaccines, just look what's happening today when we don't have one vaccine for COVID-19. But uh, that uh, infection that those folks had would spread by contact with droplets, cough to cough. Uh, so a lot of similarities for how an entire mission was put up ended uh, for its crew 
as a result of uh, this kind of background. Uh, so I'd like to ask the panel, uh, given this, uh, are there other lessons that we can learn from these viral coincidences, if you will, and uh, how the technical readiness of getting ready and being able to step in and fix Apollo 13 to bring the crew back home, uh, can that be applied to today's pandemic? Uh, Bill, do you want to take a shot at that? Well, uh, as you were introducing that question, I started to think, would we replace one crew member if it had been COVID-19? And I would say emphatically no, because as we've all known and it's been, uh, we've been told for weeks now that if one is just in contact uh, with COVID-19, they can be, become a carrier. So. Uh, they would have replaced the entire crew and probably put them into quarantine for 14 days minimum. So that that launch date would have had to have been rescheduled. Had it been something as serious as the virus that we're dealing with today. Measles by comparison was um, not in that category at all. Paul, how do you see it? Yeah, one of the interesting ones was uh, here at JSC, they're actually going through the anniversary of Apollo 13 and, and they're doing articles uh, based on the particular events. And and the, the day before launch here, they had the article here at JSC about the measles case. And uh, one of the interesting things about it was the fact uh, that uh, two of the crew members had been exposed to measles as young as you know, young adults or something in their previous uh, life. And they found out, they did the blood tests on them and found out that Lovell and uh, Hayes had the immunity to measles, which was one part of the reason why they were allowed to continue flying. You, you don't want to break up a crew. Uh, they, they spend years together training. Uh, so you want to try to keep them together. And so uh, I kind of agree with what Bill says is that with something today where it was a lot easier uh, to transmit and you didn't know how to test for immunity, uh, you would have probably replaced that entire crew uh, at the time because uh, I think they did this this swap just because they were uh, they were able to to keep the mission on 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 schedule because they were able to tell two of the crew mem prime crew members had immunity to measles. Very good. Uh, at this point, I'd like to take a shout out to some of our audience members today. I'm seeing some familiar names up there. And uh, one of the names that I go furthest back with is a gentleman named Doug Isbell. Uh, Doug uh, was a uh, journalism student back here in uh, uh, 1986, uh, doing some journalism while he was in the AE department. Uh, he's done some writing for a number of national media. And uh, Doug has this question for everybody today. Uh, what is your perspective on the commercial crew program? And in particular, our recent troubles in the Starliner capsule test flight give you any pause? Uh, Mike, do you wanna take the lead on that one? Well, sure. I think that uh, uh, one, we're getting very close now to having a true commercial crew capability in this country. It's taken a number of years. Um, but I think you test, you test, you test, you make sure everything is right. Problems occur, failures occur. You don't run ahead and you go do commercial flight until you're ready to do it. You wanna make sure everything is right. And if it takes a little more money or a couple more years, you're gonna be prepared. And um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited about the possibilities that will occur. I think when we look back 10 years from now, uh, we'll see that it was prudent to go ahead and, and, and do all this testing and have this type of crew capability. Uh, I remember back uh, several years ago when we needed to resupply the space station and the, and the space shuttle was uh, ending it, its life and activity. And NASA went forward to try to uh, look at doing commercial launch vehicles to resupply the space station. That too took more money, took more time. There were some failures along the way but we've got a very steady resupply capability now in the country. And I see the same thing for commercial space. So I'm not too worried about it. There's gonna be inevitable problems that will occur, uh, but I think things will work out really well in the future. Great. And Shivani, you ready to go take a flight? 
Absolutely, yes. I actually had the opportunity this past summer to see Jim Lovell uh, and Beth Moses of Virgin Galactic speak on this issue, uh, well not issue, this topic, um, about how commercial crew is changing the way and breadth of people, especially scientists that now can go test their test their work uh, in space. So on my perspective, I think the commercial crew program is a very much a step in the right direction. And of course, Starliner, everyone faces issues at some point in time, but as long as you keep testing, like Mr. Miller said, you are going in the right direction and making sure that you're creating the best possible space flight experience that you could. Great. Well, uh, we're also seeing some other alumni show up now and I'll uh, pass their questions along. Also want to shout out to some friends in Houston, uh, Joel Krause, Jerry Lefebvre, and then uh, my former office mate uh, when we worked for Professor Cryer here in the Aero Department many years ago, John Soldner's online. So hi, John. Good to see you here as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, John Albach, who's a member of our department and graduated in 1972, asks, uh, he was privileged to be at KSC that day with a number of Illinois colleagues to watch the launch of Apollo 13. In fact, he still has, and here's an archaic word for you, ectochrome slides, the old Kodak slides. I was especially impressed walking through the VAB, seeing the other Saturn V sitting there. Were those ships for Apollo 14 and 15? Uh, I, I would guess so. Anyone know for sure? Paul, I guess everything kind of works in the order down there at the VAB, right? Yeah, I, I would say probably they, they were because uh, I, I personally I'm amazed at how we did the launches back then, just how quick we were able to keep going with things. And but uh, we had they had the resources and the in the uh, personnel to be able to do it. And so most likely, yeah, those were the next vehicles. Yeah, the, the VAB is one of the most impressive buildings, I think, in the whole NASA facility fleet. Uh, it has its own weather. It was built so big to encompass the Saturn V's that clouds could actually form underneath its roof and it would rain inside the building at times. Uh, it's just an, an incredibly sized building. And if you ever get a chance to go down to KSC and take the tour through the visitor center, I highly recommend that. Uh, Jamie Menard, who is uh, going to be an aerospace engineering uh, graduate in 2022, has a question for Bill. Uh, Bill, she asks, uh, she's curious, is a GNC flight controller for Apollo 13 what are you, were your raw, genuine thoughts throughout the issues of the flight? Well, we were s sort of uh, all uh, very hyper. The uh, that that's not really the right word I want to say, but we were uh, acutely aware that very little uh, else could go wrong uh, besides. Uh, what did occur and even then we weren't really sure uh, the extent of the damage until they released the service module and were able to do a visual just before re-entry but uh, the the uh, results of that accident and the loss of power and having to shut the entire command and service module system down and then we started to do a uh, look at the uh, what we had for power to uh, eventually power up the command module. So, if first of all we had to uh, be sure and pray literally that nothing else went wrong, but then we had to be sure that the solutions that we proposed uh, for uh, power of the power budget as well as the uh, carbon dioxide filter that ultimately had to be uh, configured for the LEM. Um, all, the, the, all those fixes that were done on the ground and then passed up to the spacecraft, they had to work. If they didn't work, uh, we wouldn't be uh, having this um, upbeat discussion today, 50 years later. And then, of course, so I mentioned the two serious things that the uh, flight controllers on the ground had to engineer. And then, again, we were praying for nothing else to occur. Had there been another fuel leak or a pressurization leak anywhere, uh, it would have probably been an entirely different ballgame. So we were literally on edge until, as I said earlier, until we saw them on the chutes. 
and uh, we were at that point in time could uh, breathe, uh, take a, a deep exhale, and say uh, it looks like the uh, we're going to recover the crew. Very good. Uh, you know, given the the risks involved and the fact that humans are involved, this requires a lot of resources, particularly for uh, you know, the government. Today, we're handing it over to commercial operations. So Mike, I'd like to ask you about the roles of government and uh, the commercial providers in the future space program. Uh, do you think that this is an opportune time to hand over the keys to human spaceflight to the commercial folks? And what happens when they have a bad day like Apollo 13? Well, I, you know, what I've seen over uh, the last 20, 30 years of entrepreneurial activity is that it's always required a, a, a partnership between the government and the private sector. And to think that everything is going to be turned over to the private sector to be the sole decision maker on all things really, you know, doesn't, doesn't happen that way. Um, and to also on the other side to think that uh, only, you know, government uh, knows how to make decisions or can make safe decisions. That's sort of been proven out that, you know, everyone can fail, everyone can make mistakes. And it, it needs to be, you know, um, a, a group dynamic where both the private sector considerations and the government considerations are worked on together. Uh, Mike, if you remember back, uh, we, we looked at this a little bit on uh, around the year uh, 2000 when they were thinking about privatizing the space shuttle. Right. And back then it was like, what do, you know, what, what do we do? Do we give the keys to launch uh, over to uh, uh, a private company uh, for, the, for the shuttle? And the answer then, and as it would be now, is um, partly, but not, but not completely. People forget that, you know, uh, sure, life is on the line. But companies and private sector have a lot to lose. Also, uh, they cannot afford to have failures. They cannot afford to have big problems because their entire businesses would go away. So they have a bit of incentive to make sure things are right from the get-go. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Paul, uh, you know, we've had a couple of other incidents since then. Um, thinking back to the Apollo 1 fire, uh, NASA's management was in a position at that time to basically say, we're going to run the investigation. Uh, by the time we got to Challenger and Columbia, those investigations required congressional approval and boards and all sorts of things like that. It was a different time and a different day. And now we're in a, in a new environment here today, in fact, as we move forward with Commercial Crew and Orion. Uh, something like this happens. What's the day after look like? And uh, how will NASA handle something like that today? Well, I, I think you, if you're talking related to a, a, like an Orion spacecraft or a commercial crew spacecraft. Yeah. A commercial crew one? Well, both, actually. Both, yeah. yeah will they be handled so, differently? Um, I, prob I, I have to look at probably not uh, just from the standpoint of, uh, you guys were mentioning the uh, Starliner, uh, and we, we literally were investigating that with Boeing. Uh, we actually, um, literally uh, Thursday, we were getting an outbrief of, you know, what the results of that were and, and some of the lessons learned from that uh, by the folks that were on, from the NASA team that were part of that investigation with Boeing uh, to, to it. So it'll be a joint operation when we go into something like that, um, uh, mainly because obviously if we're providing the astronauts to go on there along with, uh, you know, uh, private company astronauts, uh, NASA is going to want to know what's going on with the spacecraft. So uh, we will do that. And, and I suspect, you know, for obviously for something like with Orion, um, we'll do the same types of things that we've done in the past. And, and I think probably a little bit higher level oversights will come into play uh, just because of the visibility of it um, from that aspect of it. So um, I, I think, you know, both of them are probably a bit similar. We do try to let the, in, in the commercial crew program, NASA is trying to let the commercial providers uh, do their thing and try to give them some leeway on that. Um, but we are uh, jointly when we have uh, incidents like this, looking at what they're doing and trying to make sure we're all learning the lessons learned from it. Very good, thank you. Uh, 
Bill, Philippe Gabel in our audience is asking uh, the atmosphere in the control room during the whole Apollo 13 disaster. How accurately did the movie describe that? Very, very accurately. And let me um, give you just a, an anecdote. Um, I've got a couple of pictures of some of the major players back then, and I've got it on a flash drive. I don't know if I can show those or not. Let me just try one here and see. Can you, can you see that? Can you see my thumbnails? Uh, not yet. No. All right. Let me just put that back. Um, I can describe it. There was a flight dynamics officer by the name of Jerry Bostick. And um, as it turned out, uh, 25 years later, co coincident with the, coincidental with a couple of uh, books being published, Gene, Gene Krantz's uh, book called uh, Failure is Not an Option, and then Jim Lovell's book, uh, called Lost Moon, which ultimately uh, changed uh, topics, changed, changed titles to Apollo 13. But Lovell's book had come out about coincident with the 25th anniversary. And Jerry Bostick's son at that time worked with or for uh, Ron Howard. And uh, so he was on in Ron Howard's ear saying, well, you really ought to look at that. It's a really fantastic story. And he ultimately was able to talk Ron and some of his partners to visit Houston and talk to the flight controllers who were part of that uh, successful failure. And so, because Ron was saying, I can't do it now. I've got uh, two movies uh, that I'm making and two more in the barn and this kind of thing. And uh, when he came back from Houston, he said, we got to make this film. <laughs> and Jerry Bostick, it turns out, uh, served as a, um, a, as a, co a coordinator and a consultant in the making of the movie on one condition, and that was that it was accurate. And so that's a long-winded answer to the, your comment, your question, was it accurate? Extremely accurate, yes. That, that's good to hear, because uh, I had an opportunity to either show the documentary from the Apollo 13 uh, videos that had been produced around that time, very grainy, or use the Apollo 13 clip from the movie, and, which was a lot clearer to see, and was hoping it was somewhat representative of what was going on, not only in the capsule, but on the ground. Well, they even made the actors train on what they call the vomit comet to go through weightless conditions. Very good. Uh, Paul, uh, how much redundancy is planned into systems today? Uh, for instance, in the first launch of the Columbia Space Shuttle, there were uh, uh, three uh, backups for uh, software and hardware and so forth. Uh, are we still maintaining those levels of redundancy in our systems today? There, there, there's still a certain level of redundancy. We had the, when you start talking about deep space, deep space exploration, uh, the biggest challenge we face, same thing Apollo did, is mass. Uh, you know, having, having enough capability to lift everything that you want to take into orbit and then getting it through translunar insertion to get it on the way to the moon. Uh, all that takes a very large rocket if you keep adding mass to your vehicle. And so, that's the challenge we constantly face with the NASA. And, and, and I had uh, uh, Jerry Goodman was one of the folks uh, that worked on the Apollo spacecraft uh, for crew systems. And, you know, they, they went, they go, went through every single pound on, uh, of equipment and, and material on the spacecraft to try to get it down to the bare minimum. And we're doing the same type of thing. We, we've had to do the same type of thing with Orion uh, we've had to scrub mass out. We've had to look at the systems. What we've done also is take a look at the systems that we've flown on previous vehicles like the shuttle, like Apollo, like the ISS. And we look at those and go, okay, so what are the typical failures that we've had with those type of systems? And we try to essentially design out those types of failures, make the systems simpler 
such that you try to avoid the problems that we've had in the past. So uh, for Orion, we've, we've taken that type of approach. So uh, we do have redundancy on, on, on systems, uh, but we've also tried to take out the typical failures that we've seen and the complexity of the hardware as well. We've also tried to reduce uh, so that we can uh, hopefully ensure we have a, a more successful mission going to deep space. Very good. Well, the next question is for all of you. I'd like to know where do you think now that we have the heritage of the Apollo behind us, the space shuttle, and the space station, where's the future taking us? What next? And I'm going to start with our future. Shivani, you want to take a stab at that? Absolutely. I think uh, Mars is definitely up there. That was something I was interested in even as like a young kid. And as obviously science fiction has developed, the um, inspiration only grows stronger. And I think with the combination of all the different missions that you speak of uh, and everything we've actually covered in our 498 class, um, we definitely have the technology and the brain power necessary to build up these missions, but also branch out into new exploration opportunities to prepare us. So the various rovers that we're sending to Mars, the possible drones that we're sending to moons of uh, other outer solar system planets, et cetera, um, things to basically survey these new interplanetary locations is definitely a new scientific field on its own, um, but setting that up for a future of interplanetary travel is also very exciting. Very good, thank you. Mike, how about you? Where do you think we're headed? Well, we're headed in a, in, in a lot of uh, new directions. Um, I mean, from my perspective, all, all the technology that's been developed, uh, all the knowledge that's been uh, you know, obtained, uh, both on the man side and uh, and unmanned side and satellite uh, side, uh, together with new technology breakthroughs we've had uh, in you know in electronics and materials and others, really is uh, paving the way for I think a future that's going to be multidimensional. Uh, we're moving to an era where rather than just a you know a few uh, thousand satellites uh, on orbit, we'll have tens of thousands of satellites on orbit. Uh, providing telecommunications imaging, uh, potentially you know pictures right to your right to your phone from space, but at the same time having the private sector working with government uh, going to the moon and uh, possibly uh, to Mars. The things that enable that is a genuine new interest, which wasn't there before, of people willing to invest, put money. Uh, their own personal money, uh, such as what uh, Elon Musk has done and Jeff Bezos has done in the billions of dollars, which is what it takes to do anything uh, reasonable and successful in space, and apply that to the future. So we've got a whole generation now that's willing to take, take risks on the exploration side, on the, on the business side, and on the, um, and on the government side. So it's very exciting. If you're an engineer uh, about to graduate uh, in, in, in aerospace, uh, the jobs that are available are orders of magnitude more than they were back uh, in the, in the post-Apollo era. And the different areas of aerospace you could contribute to, uh, whether it's um, uh, future exploration, manned exploration, whether it's uh, uh, building CubeSats or small satellites uh, for different types of markets, or looking at uh, transitional vehicles like um, uh, uh, small hypersonic vehicles that transition between aerospace and uh, 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 and deep space. Uh, that's just really exciting to me. So I think uh, students coming out are going to be able to uh, uh, really apply what they've learned uh, at, uh, at Illinois and elsewhere to the future. Great. And if I can add real quick, fingers crossed that there are jobs at the end of this, <laughs> um, which would be really exciting. Uh, but to build off of uh, what Mr. Miller was saying, of course, we're working across uh, the private uh, and uh, government sector line, um, but there's also a lot of international endeavors, especially for human space like going on. India, for instance, is working on their uh, crew right now uh, as far as developing their first human space flight uh, training facility, as well as working on the various uh, rocket uh, and habitation modules that would be required to do uh, these various orbits. And so not only is it just an American endeavor, there's a whole world and a set of new countries that's really uh, building upon this, this new space uh, race, but in fact, it's just a collaborative measure across all these countries. Uh, Paul, you're kind of living in the moment right now, in the future almost. 
I, I, I hope so. I really do. Um, I, like I said, I've been here for 31 years and uh, uh, I've been through uh, two previous efforts to go back to the moon or on the Mars. Uh, and, and I keep telling people this is actually the first time we're actually building a, we actually built a vehicle, the, the, the Artemis One vehicle. Uh, is down at KSC right now, and we're, we're going to be hopefully launching that next year. And and it, we're we're actually building real vehicles to go back to deep space. And so that to me is the most exciting part of this. And I, I really agree with everyone else. I hope this is the stepping stone. And uh, kind of what also what Mike was talking about from the standpoint of the partnerships. Uh, I am a big believer in that, having lived through the beginning of station. Uh, and the partnerships that we had with the Russians. I know that at the time, I remember thinking in the early 1990s, oh my gosh, we're going to be partners with the Russians. <laughs> um, and it, it just worked out. I, being an EVA flight controller uh, in 2004, uh, when we lost our capability with the U.S. spacesuits on station and we had failures that we needed to go outside for, uh, we collaborated with the Russians and used their spacesuits and sent, our, sent the crew out, sent them over onto our U.S. segment, and they fixed it and went back into their airlock, and we were all happy. Um, so, uh, you know, that type of redundancy and cooperation between partners, is, I believe, is the way of the future. There, there's no doubt about it. Uh, because there's no way we can just do this by ourselves. Yeah, that's so true. Well, Bill, there's another movie that comes to mind. It's called Back to the Future, and it seems like you lived it already, and uh, we're trying to re-emulate that now with some of the work we're doing and then uh, perhaps on other places. What's your feelings on the topic? On the topic of the future, well, of course, you're uh, on the removed a couple of generations. I really feel, feel the payoff is in low Earth orbit, colonization and uh, industrialization, but in low Earth orbit. I just don't think that, I think we can accomplish uh, a whole lot for the near future, and I say maybe five or 10 decades uh, with unmanned satellites for interplanetary exploration and deep space exploration. Okay, so I'm going to uh, in the inner, maybe at an intermediate uh, distance, and what what about the moon? And um, there's a whole lot of uh, opinions on uh, what we would do as objectives uh, when we, uh, and I do say when because I'm convinced it'll it'll occur. We when we return uh, re, uh, return to the moon. I heard a, uh, a fascinating talk by uh, an attorney at Ole Miss in Oxford a few months ago, and she deals with uh, interplanetary uh, law. And uh, what about all the artifacts, the experiments that are left on the moon, the footprints, who owns them? And will the next uh, explorers to the moon be, if they're US, uh, if it's a US team or, uh, in, uh, say perhaps international team uh are they going to go in and just uh willy-nilly uh plow over those uh footprints uh whom do they belong to their their uh world treasures and so that raises a lot of legal problems and legal questions right all right so i've got a one word question for all of you are you ready robots or humans mike you want to start uh, humans. Paul? Can I say both? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can see. Uh, I, I, I believe both, absolutely. Uh, you have to have humans, and I believe you have to have robots. I, I think we, we, we need to do the thing where we learn from the, the robots going out first to kind of set the stage for us to do the environments and, and, and learn the background, and then the humans go and we're that much farther along when we get there. Very good. Shivani? I definitely agree. Uh, I think, like I said, I was saying before, the act of surveying these various planets before entering with uh, crewed missions uh, is very important, but I'm a huge human space flight nerd, so I'd have to say human in the end. And Bill? Well, near term, uh, the next several decades, I would say robots for deep space or intercontinental exploration 
and certainly humans for uh, low Earth orbit. Very good. Well, we have a question from our audience, uh, Meg Hoffner, who's a grad from 2007 and uh, I believe got a master's degree in 2009, asks, uh, during a mission, everyone has particular duties. Everyone uh, has the comm flow laid out for them. Uh, you have the flight director on console giving directions like the general, the capsule communicator, putting uh, all of that together for the astronauts on orbit. Uh, how did that all get set up in the first place? Who architected mission control? Bill? Chris Craig. Yep. And, and uh, What was it like working with Chris? I never had the pleasure or the honor of meeting the man. I knew uh, a lot of people that uh, were direct uh, spinoffs from, from Chris. They, uh, he had mentored them. Uh, Gene Krantz comes to mind, and of course, uh, you've uh, heard the names of Glenn Lenny and um, Jerry Griffin, and uh, there was a, one other, oh, Cliff Charlesworth, who unfortunately is no longer with us. So those, uh, those four, and there was one other uh, flight director, uh, actually he was um, English, um, but uh, he, he wasn't part of the Apollo program, but Chris Kraft and his team, uh, they literally wrote the book on all things flight control. They'd never done this before. No one ever had, no human had. And so they just sat down there and, and uh, brainstormed what do they need? What, do the, what will it take? What kind of computing power do they need? What kind of personnel do they need? and how many specialties do they need? And um, yes, so that's how that evolved. Very neat. So, so how much time did you spend in the outpost? <laughs> Bill? I, I didn't hear the first part. How much time did you spend in the outpost after Apollo 13? Oh, uh, you're talking about maybe the red barn, was that, or the singing wheel? Well, that's one of them too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the outpost. Uh, that's that's a uh, uh, a tavern. I'm not familiar with that name. I'm familiar with a few. Uh, actually, what what occurred on a 13 specifically was uh, it landed. Uh, it splashed down in late morning or early afternoon. Someone had the forethought to reserve the entire officers' club at Ellington Air Force Base, about five miles away. And so all the flight controllers went uh, there for lunch and um, uh, a fair amount of beer to uh, unwind. And so we, we took over the, uh, the dining room of uh, the officers club at Ellington for that particular mission. And uh, that, that was uh, the right thing to do. We had developed a camaraderie uh, like none other. And uh, so we wanted to remain as a team. Yeah, the, the splashdown parties in that era were legendary. Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, some more than others. <laughs> um, Apollo 11, I'll just mention uh, the, the Holiday Inn and probably all the uh, hotels in the area, but I, I was at Holiday Inn. Their entire landscaping was brutally trashed because the whole city of Houston descended on Clear Lake for. Uh, for the event. Yeah, I can imagine. And uh, sort of a question for everybody. Um, what did your experiences in college, uh, how did they prepare you for your jobs today? And uh, what kinds of things, particularly for you, like Paul as a hiring manager or Mike, what are you looking for in today's engineers that are graduating out of college? Uh, Paul, you want to start? Sure. Um, so, I, I, I first of all, it was uh, actually it was funny because uh, after I first started working here at JSC, um, I started getting into some of the topics and the issues that we were dealing with, and then all of a sudden I started realizing, oh, this is just like this class, or this is just like this class. Um, uh, Professor Sintman's space environments class that I took back then. It was I think my last semester. 
at Illinois when I was finishing up my master's. Uh, when you start learning about atomic oxygen drag on a spacecraft and, and, and all those type of things, uh, Professor Prushing's uh, orbital mechanics class, uh, boy, I, orbital mechanics comes in great to understand what we're doing here. So there's a lot of things that like that that kind of uh, you don't think about it at the time when you're in the class, but in this particular role, it, does, it, was, it was great to have that type of background. Um, I think as an engineer, uh, the way we're taught and the way we're, we, we, we look at problems and the way we try to solve problems, uh, that, that's a basic fundamental that you need to have in this type of field. It, you know, that, 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 that discipline to step through, you know, the, the, the process of, of, of thinking about what the theory might be of what the problem is and then, uh, you know, figuring out what data you need to go and, and figure out what is the issue. We've got a lot of them we're dealing with right now. Um, and so I think that helps and that's the type of thing you look at and teamwork as Bill's mentioned uh, and, and I've lived through with, with mission control as well is just the teamwork. You have to be able to work with people. Um, if you, you know, so that's one of the biggest things I'll, I'll honestly say is having folks that work well together in a team uh, that put themselves uh, just as a member of the team and, and, and uh, are, are feeling like there's something uh, of a bigger, bigger greatness. Uh, that's the way we think of it here at NASA is, is you know, we're, we're doing something that's bigger than ourselves. And so uh, we want to be able to contribute. We want to be able to do that teamwork to make it happen. And so folks coming out of college, that, that's one of the biggest things is, is that ability to work with others. Mike? Well, I see a number of things. One is that um, as my career progressed, um, I looked back and appreciated each, you know, more and more having the aerospace engineering degree from, from Illinois. Uh, one, obviously being uh, learning about the fundamentals of aerospace in so many different disciplines. Aerospace has, has got many things uh, that you have to know, aside from orbital mechanics, obviously, uh, and in physics, you're learning about materials, there's, a, there, there, there's electrical, thermal, you, you name it, you go on. And a lot of these uh, disciplines can apply to things other than aerospace. So um, I've learned as I looked at uh, many, many businesses over the years, seeing many, many technologies, having that grounding from Illinois was, was, was extremely valuable. The one thing I have noticed in, in folks that I have worked with that graduated from Illinois over the years um, was that with each successive set of years, the, uh, the folks seem to be more and more prepared to go, on, go in and take on responsibility immediately. Um, uh, the, what they've learned, uh, what they do in labs, what they do in teamwork, um, as was just mentioned by Paul, uh, that can be applied directly uh, on a, a on the job and it's very important so uh, what I would look for and what I see are you know people that have taken uh, and students have made the most of their time uh, at Illinois not just to learn but to uh, be part of AIAA or be part of um, Illinois Space Society or any of these things where they could learn to collaborate uh, and, and work together as a team. Bill, I, I know you are uh, got some start. At, did you Were you born and raised in Oklahoma? I was not. I was born and raised in Buffalo, New York, as a matter of fact. And that's where I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Buffalo. Okay. Uh, but then you passed through Oklahoma at some point. I know some good people that went through there, like our current administrator, uh, Tom Stafford, and, uh, of course, our favorite uh, head of the House Appropriations Committee for Space right now. So, Fred Hayes. Fred, Fred Hayes was also an OU grad. Yes, that's right. That's right. So, how did uh, how did college prepare you? Uh, I probably can say the best, the most uh, productive part of my education, I think, were the labs. And I think, if anything, we ought to enhance the laboratories that go with the uh, theoretical part of the engineering courses, because what the, the uh, capability of the engineers and their background, the flight controllers, they're, I, 
there were a few with master's degrees, and those few were probably us Air Force guys that were on loan to NASA. The, uh, the names that you've heard about, uh, Gene Krantz and the Glenn Lennies and the Jerry Griffins, they were, there are no uh, Nobel laureates there, and they all had bachelor's degrees. They were fresh out of college, but they knew how to solve problems. And so um, I think that's the part of my uh, undergrad and grad, even was well, undergraduate especially, was the, the laboratory part that went with the, uh, the, the courses, learning how to solve problems. Yeah, that's, that's very important. So Shivani, do you think you learned anything here today from these old guys? Uh, I would say so, I would say so. But yes, I think just like this panel, there are a multitude of really unconventional learning experiences that you have to keep pursuing. Um, I've definitely seen that in my past three years, for two and a half, three years um, at uh, U of I. At, in every single class, I always try to raise my hand, even though it's scary and you may not have like the most well-formulated question, just keep asking. Uh, and learn as much as you can. Always uh, going to faculty themselves, like faculty members themselves, and getting that one-on-one -on -one interaction, whether it be through office hours or other appointments. Um, but also with the Illinois Space Society, like we mentioned before, just taking a really active role and making sure that you are confronting things that really scare you. Uh, I know I experienced that when I was the rocketry team lead uh, for the space grant project my freshman year. I knew nothing about high power rocketry. I was just a really excited, uh, slightly naive freshman um, in the aerospace department. And me, uh, me and my team just came on to the challenge saying that if we don't know something, we're gonna learn it together, uh, whether it takes a whole night of searching the depths of the internet for how many like ejection charges you need to set off this part of the rocket, et cetera. Um, just taking every opportunity to learn, even if it scares you. So in summary, I did learn a lot and hopefully senior year will bring even more learning. Uh, that's great. Uh, I've got one more one word question for y'all. This comes from our audience. Uh, David Degenhall asked us, worm or meatball? Paul, you got the meatball on your shirt there. Yeah, I, I, I was around when they, uh, they went from the worm back to the meatball, uh, and now I guess we're starting to reintroduce the worm. I, I hate to say it, I like them both still. <laughs> I, 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 I kind of missed it because uh, I see Bill's got the worm on his shirt. Uh, so, you know, I, I like them both. I, I, I'm, I, I think the, I like the worm from the futuristic type standpoint. I, I liked it. Yeah, it's Mike. it's simplistic. That's why I favor the That's one. It. Yeah. Mike. Oh, uh, it's got to be the meatball for me. And uh, if you ever watch the Apollo 13 movies, there's like thir 13 little flaws in there, even though it was reproduced uh, perfectly. But there's a worm buried in uh, in one of the scenes, uh, which uh, I challenge you all to go go find. There's a Saturn V problem. Um, and uh, what was interesting, real quickly, Apollo 13, I happened to uh, get into uh, the company Digital Domain that all did all the special effects. I was uh, part of a company that uh, uh, did position measurement and got to see what all those models look like. Uh, and it's amazing what uh, can be done uh, even back then to uh, reproduce accurately uh, the, uh, the events that occurred back at Apollo 13. All right, Shivani, what's your vote? I'm gonna have to say the meatball just because I grew up on <laughs> I grew up on it, and the first NASA T-shirt I ever got was a meatball uh, logo. So I think I'm very emotionally invested. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Well, I think we're going to end up seeing a little bit of both in the near future, uh, based on the next commercial crew vehicle carrying the worm on the side, and I'm sure the astronauts on board will have the meatball in their suit somewhere. Uh, not to mention the good old American flag. So. Uh, I just want to say thank you to you all and uh, go around the horn one time if you have any last comments. We've uh, about used up our hour here. And uh, this has been a real privilege for me today to be able to speak with you all and have the audience that we've had online. Uh, we've had a lot of good questions coming in and it's uh, just been a real pleasure. So uh, Mike, you want to, any last thoughts? Oh, uh, thanks for, uh, for having me. I think this has been uh, terrific. Um, 
you know, when I thought of Apollo 13 uh, in, in this event, I went back to, uh, and, um, you know, Bill mentioned it, the, uh, the book uh, that was put together by Jim Lovell and I think Jeffrey Kluger. If, uh, if uh, you haven't read it, um, find it. Uh, uh, you can probably find it in your library, or maybe even uh, and download it now. Because it really, um, uh, if you read it, you really learn a lot about some of the engineering decisions that, uh, that went into bringing Apollo 13 astronauts back. Uh, you get a little flavor for the emotion and the, um, and the intensity that was uh, occurring. A lot of it was in the movie, but just reading the book will give you a whole lot more. Yeah. And Mike, I uh, just want to call your attention to the chat. Our good friend Wes just dialed in to hear your last comments. Okay, well, <laughs> good for us. And uh, shout out also to Doug Isabel. I remember him. He was a uh, reporter here in the Washington area, uh, just starting out, and was really great to see an Illinois grad uh, um, uh, in this particular region uh, writing about the space industry. Paul, how about you? Last thoughts? Um, you know, one of the things I thought was interesting, like was Mike was kind of mentioning about with the anniversary coming up here, I was kind of going through some of the old articles. I actually also got the uh, technical debrief uh, that the crew did, uh, and I was reading through that last weekend just to kind of gather some interesting thoughts and, and stuff. And one of the ones that I noticed that isn't really, I don't know if folks, it wasn't really pulled out in the movie, the CO2 issue always seems to get a lot of the description of, of, of this great engineering feat and thing. The one that really doesn't come out is the fact about water. Um, and, and the, you know, with the loss of the oxygen tanks and the, and the fuel cells, which generated the drinking water for the crew, they literally only had the water left in the CM tanks at the time. So, um, they, they lived on three to six ounces of water coming home every day. And, and so they drank the juice bags uh, that were in part of the food packs. Uh, they, and, and literally, uh, uh, Lovell says in the debrief that essentially on the last day, they were going into the last juice pack to get the last juice out because that's all that was left. And uh, they, the crew lost 31 pounds during that mission. And, and I, I, that's one of the things that actually never really comes out during the mission. To me, not having water for a few days is a big deal as well since I'm, I work with life support systems for Ryan and that. So, um, you know, that was an interesting one that it, it just didn't seem to rank because I guess the CO2 one, but, uh, from the perspective of, of today, I really appreciate uh, you guys doing this and, uh, um, putting this together to be able to allow us to, to provide some of our thoughts. And, and again, Bill, I, I really appreciate uh, what you did for us and, and, and keeping the program going back then. Because I really do believe uh, it might have been a different situation, uh, depending on how things turned out back then. Yeah, Paul, and, and, and my uh, thoughts similarly, and, and thanks very much for being here today, uh, representing our future. Good luck with Orion, and uh, we hope to hear some good news in that area very soon. Bill, last thoughts? Well, uh, on Paul's comment, I just want to say I was one member of a very large team, and it was an honor to be part of that team, as it was an honor to be part of this uh, five-person team today. Uh, this hour went by in about 15 minutes. Uh, I would recommend, and you talked about the water, Paul, uh, I was able to, and I didn't know these existed until just the other day, a friend of mine uh, text me about the podcast that put together by the BBC and season one was all of Apollo 11 but season two is Apollo 13 and uh, it's called 13 minutes to the moon I'm not quite sure of the significance of that title 13 minutes to the moon but uh, it's number four talks about it's entitled power brokers and it talks about the uh, the design and the engineering and the problem solving that had to go into their shortage of power and how they had to reconfigure uh, with anticipation of powering up the command module for re-entry. And then the other one, number five, talked about the uh, CO2 uh, problem and especially the water shortage that came out. Uh, that, those podcasts are very, very good. And just uh, a just a, a word to um, uh, Shanani, uh, aim high, you're going places. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.
Yeah, Shivani, uh, looks like you get the last word today. Whenever I go out talking to <laughs> other groups, I always point out that uh, there's always a lot of inertia in systems engineering in the space program. Once you have something that works, you don't want to deviate away from it. And yet, we don't want to remain totally mired in the old ways of doing business. We'd like to be able to do things more efficiently. Uh, I hate to say it, better, faster, and cheaper. And to be able to go out and achieve the goals that you and your generation are looking for. So I encourage you to continue to pursue those dreams. When you see someone that says no, show them why the answer is yes. And with that, I'll give you the last word. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So thank you, especially everyone that's on this panel. I'm definitely on the uh, lower end of the experience, but I really admire all the work that you all have done for the realm of human space flight and aerospace in general. It's really inspiring and reviving, especially in a time where college classes can be a bit uh, hard. Um, so it's a very good inspiration. Um, as far as final words go, I think what keeps me going as far as pursuing human space led endeavors is especially what I heard this past summer. I was interning at the Adler Planetarium uh, and for their Apollo 11 celebration, uh, Jim Lovell and Beth Moses were having a conversation about uh, the ver their various eras of human space flight. Um, but the commonality between the two was their practical approach as far as engineers uh, within the airspace field, but also their excitement to keep trying new things even when uh, everything could possibly go wrong. And that's what Lovell talked a lot about uh, with his Apollo 13 experience and how Beth Moses um, was talking about the constant testing, constant testing process um, with how our Virgin Galactic works. So uh, beyond, like even within the private sector and the government sector, uh, whatever lines that you can possibly draw, everyone is just working towards uh, building these new dreams. So it's a very exciting era to be within airspace. Very good, ILL. I and I. <laughs> there you have it. And on that note, I want to uh, say that uh, there have been a lot of good questions coming from the audience. Unfortunately, we don't have time to answer them all today. However, we're gonna collect them up and uh, send them out to our panelists. If you folks don't mind uh, taking a few emails to answer a couple of other questions that came along, we'll uh, take care of that. And I also wanna give a big thanks to uh, Courtney uh, for all of her tremendous effort in setting this up today. Bravo. Um, we all have been social distancing, uh, but I think Courtney brought us all together here today in a very fine fashion. So I really appreciate that and all the work that's been done uh, all the way around. So uh, I just, uh, just wanna say it was my pleasure and we're looking at maybe doing a few more of these webinars. So if any of our alums or audience out there have ideas of what you would like to hear, um, feel free to send them to me. I'll put my email in the chat box so you can send those. Great. And thanks for everyone that uh, dialed in today to, to listen to this. I hope you found it entertaining. Uh, I know it's certainly a pleasure to hear the perspectives of a, a broad uh, uh, types uh, from across our community here, and uh, particularly to Bill, Mike, Paul, and Shivani. Thanks very much for participating today. Bye now. <laughs>